Thanks for joining today. Before we get started, please make sure you have subscribed and are liking what's getting put out. We're going to get back into discussing some of the physics and biomechanics of the human body because we can use this to our advantage in order to get better, res better responses from our exercise. Warning. The following presentation contains information that might contradict what you have previously heard or believed to be true about how the human body works and contains material that is not suitable for closed-minded individuals. Enjoy. And so we're going to uh, be discussing some of the key concepts that relates to the physics of how the human body works. I know, big troublesome topic for a lot of people. But we're going to look at basically four distinct uh, things here. We're going to look at what's referred to as the kinematic chain, what's referred to as lines of pull, the lever systems that we use in our body, and then how our center of mass, center of gravity, and base of support will be impacted based off of the exercises that we use and how we go about doing the exercises. So let's start off by talking about the kinematic chain. So the kinematic chain is simply a description of how the muscles, the bones, and the joints are all working together to allow us to move. In this, we have two distinct ways of looking at the kinematic chain. We can discuss this as a closed chain episode. This is where the distal end of the limb is fixed. Or as an open chain episode, this is where the distal end is free to move. And so we might be working the same muscles, but the way in which we're using the kinematic chain is going to impact directly the physics that are being applied to the muscles and the resulting effect that exercise is going to have. When we start looking at how the muscles are going to work and how the bones are going to work in terms of allowing us to do movement, we have to look at what's referred to as the lines of pull. And the lines of pull is the direction of force relative to the reference axes that we're looking at. And this is where we have to go back and remember our physics equations. Force equals mass times acceleration. But we have a problem. And the problem is that the body is not planar. The body is not one flat line. We have the geometry of the body in which we have an x-axis, the transverse plane, a y-axis, the sagittal plane, or the z-axis, the coronal plane, that has to be incorporated into the movement. And so we end up getting, we end up getting what's referred to as a resultant force. And the resultant force is based off of the sum of forces based off of the y-axis and the x-axis through sine and cosine of the angle of application. What this does is this generates a rotational or a torque movement at the joints that are moving. In this, we're going to have the ability to maximize our x-axis and our y-axis based off of the angle of pull that's happening within the muscle itself. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we're combining the x and the y axis to give us the maximum amount of force available, where as we get closer to a pure vertical axis, we're going to lose the cosine variable, the x axis. As we get to a purely horizontal line of pull, we're going to lose the y axis, the sine variable, within the sum of all forces. And so when we start looking at how much muscle force we're able to generate, it's about combining the X and the Y vectors of force in terms of getting the summed forces within the movement. That distinct factor within the development of forces that generates that gets generated within muscle strengths is why if we look at model one and model two here on the image, why we have hypertrophy in which the fibers get bigger cross-sectionally and not hyperplasia, where we get more fibers following training. The bigger the fiber, the longer the time we're gonna have both X and Y components to the motion within the muscle, within that line of pull. And so that's very specific. We start looking at lines of pull within the muscle, within the fiber itself. But it's not just the fiber itself that's gonna give us a line of pull, but the angulation that the muscles have, in which we have distinct shapes of muscles, parallel, unipinnate, bipinnate, and multipinnate, that will all provide different distinct lines of pull based off of how they are oriented around the central tendons. And then we have the convergent muscle, and the convergent muscle is going to give us zero fixed line of pull, where we have an infinite number of lines of pulls that are available. Based off of the number of lines of pull that we have within each distinct muscle type, 
we're going to be able to get greater amounts of strength, where the convergent muscle will, will be able to provide the greatest amount of strength, be able to produce the most mechanical force because it's never going to be losing either the X or the Y component to the motion, whereas the parallel will provide the least amount of strength, the least amount of force, because it will very quickly lose both the X and the Y based off of the, the orientation of the body and the orientation of pull being generated by the muscle within the exercise. The lines of pull is going to combine with the lever system that we're going to attempt to generate motion with. So the levers are simply just the description of how forces are being placed around the joint that's going to lead to the movements that we're looking at. We classify them on three distinct classes, first class, second class, and third class. Each one's going to have a distinct advantage and disadvantage based off of force or torque that's being available, the tensile strength that we can develop, and the overall power that can be generated. And so how can we look at these lever systems? Well, if we look at in terms of the body, we have first class levers, such as in between the skull and the cervical vertebrae. We have a second class lever system, such as what we see down in the foot and ankle. And then we have a third class lever system, such as what we see with the elbow in the upper extremity. And if you notice, the difference between each one of these is the relative distance between the application force, that is the muscle acting, and the load, the resistance, that the muscle has to act against. Where in the first class lever system, the resistance and the force are on opposite sides of the joint, what's referred to here as the fulcrum. In the second class lever system, the force has a longer distance to the fulcrum relative to the resistance. Where in the third class lever system, the resistance has a longer distance than the force does to the fulcrum. And what this does is this provides based off of the distance between the resistance and force loads relative to the point of rotation, we get a distance, what's referred to as a lever arm. The longer the lever arm, the more advantage that distinct physical force has. So in third class lever systems, the resistance has a longer lever arm than the force does, than the muscle force does. Whereas in the second class lever system, the resistance has a shorter lever arm than what the muscle force or the muscle strength lever arm has. Those distinct differences leads to distinct advantages and disadvantages between the various. So let's see how we can go about utilizing these lever systems to our advantage or disadvantage within the gym. So notice that we have the purple muscle tension line and the red load line. Now notice how I now get more mechanical advantage as the load becomes closer to the fulcrum, whereas the resistance, as, as the muscle force stays further away. Now what happens if I flip this? Now I have less mechanical advantage. And so this is where, in terms of that atlo-occipital articulation, we want to have good, correct ergonomic posture, where the more forward I bring my head, the more muscle action I'm going to need, whereas the more I can tuck my chin in and keep everything in an erect posture, the less muscle tension I will have. I can see the same type of action in terms of the spinal erectors around the pelvis in terms of the ability to keep an erect posture. It's the same type of lever system. And so I lose advantage based off of where I have those lever arms relative to each other, where it's the greatest when I get the muscle force to be greater than the resistance arm, and it's the least when I get the resistance arm to be greater than the force arm. So now let's take a look at the second class. So in the second class lever, as I move through the motion, I start to lose mechanical advantage. I start to lose mechanical advantage as the two force arms start to have an equal distance from the fulcrum based off of the vertical axis. And so 
as I move through the second class lever, I start to lose the mechanical advantages I get as the difference between the two lines becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And so this is where you can think about it's kind of easy to stand a little bit on your tiptoes, but it's very hard to stand all the way up on your tiptoes. Now, some say, oh, well, it's about a balance issue. But the balance issue that you're talking about is the ability to keep that mechanical advantage in terms of force of contraction. So let's take a look at the third class lever system and watch what happens as I move through the third class lever. Now notice, as I went through the third class lever, at the very bottom and at the very top of the motion, I had the greatest mechanical advantage. However, in the mid-range, I had the least mechanical advantage. And so this is where, if you go to the fitness centers and you'll watch the people doing like the bicep curls. And so when we start looking at that, we have to remember is that most of the joints within the extremities are going to be third class lever systems. And so when we're watching people do bicep curls, for example, one of the things that happens is that we're going to get a sticking point. And so that sticking point is the distance that we have in that mid range where we have the greatest lever arm distance between the load and the muscle. And so because we have that least amount of lever arm in the muscle relative to the load, we can produce the least amount of mechanical advantage. And so one of the things we can do is we can use that point as an isometric load point, or we can use that point within the mid range as an eccentrically loading point. Because it provides the greatest disadvantage, we have the greatest potential for mechanical overload and thus mechanical growth factors to be stimulated, meaning we can produce the greatest amount of muscle growth if we were to load within those mid ranges more than at the very top or at the very bottom of the motion. The other thing we can do is we can change the angulation by which we attack the muscle. And by changing the angulation by which we attack the muscle, we reduce the mechanical disadvantage that we might have in those mid range points. So the other thing we have to look at in terms of the physics of movement is what's the center of mass, center of gravity. Center of mass and center of gravity is approximately 56% 50 of your body height. And it's a static point, which means that that point is going to stay relatively stable on a horizontal line, even though the body is going to be moving. So what's going to happen is that based, based on how we move, we're going to have to develop distinct muscle actions in the X and in the Y axis and in the Z axis as we move through space in an attempt to correct the displacement that we have based off of load to one side of the body or the other. This is where we can utilize the need to keep a static center of mass and center of gravity in our lower extremity exercise sessions so as to train the quote core. This is where we don't have to sit there and do the six minute abs or the seven minute abs or the seven minute crunch routines or the seven minute ab routines. If we're gonna train lower body, if we're gonna train doing things like deadlifts and squats, where we can utilize selected movements that will maximize the displacement that might have in the center mass and center gravity, along with changing the base of support. The base of support is the relative differences that we see in between the distance of foot contacts to the ground relative to the line of center of gravity as we go through the motions. And so when we start talking about movements and stability in the gym, it's not just about center of mass and center of gravity, it's also about base of support. The more stable my base of support, the wider my stance is, the more I can have displacement of center of mass and center of gravity without losing that control mechanism. And that's because what we do is we basically establish a larger area of control. And by establishing a larger area of control, we minimize the displacement of that center of mass and center of gravity away from the vertical line. 
which means we're going to minimize the x and the z motion of the center of gravity and center of mass in the motions that we see within doing full body lower extremity exercise. It's the same thing that we can look at when we start looking at the difference in utilization of basis support on a bench press versus on a push-up or a basis support that we see uh, when we look at utilizing uh, single limb actions versus double limb actions. And so let's take a look at some of the stereotypical exercises we might see within the gym and how we can apply that center of, bat, center of mass, center of gravity, and base of support, as well as the type of muscles that we might see acting in order to maximize the activation that's taking place and maximize the resultants that we might see or the results we might see from our exercise session. That is, be able to produce the most amount of strength, produce the most amount of force that we might be able to produce within the gym. So let's take a look at a few examples of exercises that we might all do in the gym. And let's discuss how we can utilize center mass, center of gravity, lever systems, and muscles, lines, and poles to our advantage to maximize our efforts. So if we look here in a push-up, the push-up can vary its advantages, its disadvantages, and its workload based off of placement of hands, placement of feet, in order to establish a wide or narrow base of support, as well as change the angulation of pull that we might see within the muscles of action during the push-up, as well as where we might have pauses based off of sticking points within the third class lever systems that we're ex utilizing in the action. Something very similar we might see within the bench press where we can utilize hand placement and width of hand placements within the exercise, as well as angulation of the body relative to the bench in order to either cause an advantage or disadvantage to the physics of the motions that are taking place. Along with sticking points that might occur based off of lines of pull and the third class lever systems that we are utilizing, as well as the base of supports that we might have during the activity. Now, if you notice here, we have two distinct types of chest flies. The difference that we see between the chest flies here is the angulation relative to gravitational load, that is how much of the Y axis relative to the X axis we might be utilizing in terms of advantage or disadvantage to the motion that we see within the chest fly. Notice we're still gonna use the pectoralis muscles, pectoralis major in particular, to generate the majority of the movement. However, because of the change in the Y axis, the lobe forces placed on the pectoralis muscle will vary something we can use when we look at bench pressing as well. Okay, what about lower extremities? Well, if we look at it, we're gonna have a deadlift and a power clean, very similar angulations at the very bottom of the exercise. However, we're gonna change where that weight happens to be relative to the center of mass, changing the center of mass to center of gravity of the person, causing additional stability to be utilized. And because we have this change in angulation and change in position of the body and change the position of the weight, we're gonna have greater or less muscle requirements within the activity. So we can also see when we start looking at squats, whether, whether it's a front squat or a rear squat, in terms of where is that weight and how is that weight being displaced around my center of, center of mass and center of gravity? And how is that gonna impact the amount of muscle control is necessary in order to keep the body stable and allow for movements to take place. We can see this same exact thing if we start looking at heavier and heavier loads that we might incorporate within the exercise. Where heavier loads may require more muscle force and more muscle strength in order to generate the motion required, but it's also going to require greater amounts of stabilization and different angulations of the body within the motion, along with foot placements, in order to establish a broader base of support due to the ever-increasing load that's being placed around the center of mass and center of gravity. 
thanks for watching. Hopefully you got a little bit out of the discussion here. Make sure you're clicking that like button. Please make sure you're clicking the subscribe button, sharing out what we're doing. Make sure you're following us on all of the various platforms that we're publishing on.